Turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. We'll be looking at uh, chapters 3 and 4 today. Having to take pretty good chunks of the Word to deal with these dangers today is the danger of unbelief. And we will not read all of those verses. I read part of them a little bit earlier. We'll pick up in verse 11. The danger of unbelief, he says. So, I swear, God swears in his wrath, they shall not enter my rest, they shall not go into the land of promise. Writer of the Hebrews says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Oh my goodness. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, as you have opportunity, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness and the delusion of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. We are uh, members one of another with Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Literally, disobedience and unbelief. Chapter 4, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into rest, any of you should come short of it. You miss out on all that the Lord has for you. For unto us was the gospel preached as well unto them. The truth was preached to them as unto us. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Oh my goodness. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us, as believers, labor, strive, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man, lest any person, fall after the same example of unbelief. The danger of unbelief. Now, I shared with you the spiritual lesson that relates to their ge geogra geographical movements. Egypt, wilderness, in the fullness of the land. That parallels to the Christian life. Delivered from the bondage of sin. Walking in the wilderness is like walk, still walking and struggling in your flesh. And then the land parallels to victory in Christ. We surrender to the point that our life is surrendered to, them, to Him. He's on the throne of our life. Through abiding, yielding, and obeying, we have the fruit of the Spirit released in our life. And Jesus is producing himself through us. It is his power that gives us the victory. You can't live the Christian life in the power of your flesh. You have to live it in the power of Christ. And when you surrender and you walk in the spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You walk in the presence of Jesus. You walk in the fellowship with Jesus. His presence is about your life. His power is about your life. There is a certain amount of rest that comes into your life because you're not fighting yourself all the time about, well, should I go to church today or not? You, 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 you don't do That fight's over. You go because you want to go. You want to be there. You want to be with the Lord's people. And so that is the backdrop for this, the danger of unbelief. The word unbelief is used several times in your text. And in Zodiotti's uh, word study, the New Testament, it's about faithlessness or uncertainty, distrust, unbelief. In the New Testament, it is the lack of acknowledgement of Christ. It is the lack of confidence in His power. Who you are in Jesus and who Jesus is in you. And in general, it is the lack of trust in the God of promise. God is a God who makes promises over and over and over to deliver His people, to empower them so that they can live for Him. These believers were going back on what they had been promised. They were going back on what they had been told. They wanted to back up on the Lord. 
He says you can't do that. You've got to go on to maturity. You've got to go on and walk in victory in Christ. There was a danger of unbelief. He says, you're getting ready to make the same mistake, the same sin that your forefathers did. You refuse to believe God. You refuse to believe that you can have and be who the Bible says that you can be in Christ. You can string together several different promises in the New Testament. It says, I can do all things through Jesus Christ with strength in me. Are you experiencing that? Are you allowing Christ to help you do all things. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lesson. Are you walking in the Spirit? Are you walking in that spiritual rest? Are you walking in the power of Christ? These believers did not believe, they, they were not believing that Christ could lead them into that victory. And they belonged to the church in the wilderness. And they're getting ready to experience the same thing that their forefathers did because of the danger of unbelief. So how does the writer steer them away from that? How does he help them? How does the Lord help us in that? There are three things in here that I want you to see. The first one is this. Let us be extremely careful. As believers, we must be extremely careful. In verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The words take heed, two words in English, one word in the Greek text, means to be seeing to it con constantly. To be seeing to it constantly. What is it that we need to be seeing to? Our spiritual life in Christ. Our spiritual fellowship with the Lord. We need to be in the Word constantly. We need to be in prayer constantly. We need to be walking in proper fellowship with the Lord constantly. Be seeing to it constantly. Keep a watchful eye ever open because the enemy is laying traps for you every which way is under the sun to trip you up. So you've got to be seeing to your spiritual life constantly. You have to be extremely careful. And many would say, why? Why do we need to be so diligent about this? Why do we need to be focusing on the Lord? What is he saying? Lest any of you wind up developing an evil heart of unbelief. An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Folks, that's scary. <laughs> you start backing up on God, that is scary. The word... There is a difference between an evil heart and an evil heart of unbelief. A big difference. He's saying believers need to be very careful that they do not develop an evil heart of unbelief. That word evil is defined in the word study as a person, a believer who gets himself into sin and corruption and he's content to stay there. He's happy to be there. He's happy to be in the wilderness. He's happy not to go on with God. He is okay with not looking after his spiritual life. He is okay with not having his quiet time. He's okay with not praying. He is okay with not coming to church regularly. He is okay of being in charge of his life and he develops an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The word depart doesn't mean just go and leave and never come back. It means to stand aloof. In other words, I'm going to keep my Lord at an arm's distance. I, this thing's going to become about convenience for me. I'm going to participate when it's convenient for me because if I am okay being in charge of my own life, making my own decisions, I am okay in my sin and my corruption and God being kept at an arm's length. Standing aloof from God. How do we avoid the danger of unbelief? <laughs> Man, if you don't stay in the Word and stay in your proper fellowship with the Lord, you find yourself drifting out there through neglect. And the next thing you know, you're okay being separated by, from, from the Lord. You're okay 
in your sin and in your corruption. You're satisfied being in that state. Don't bother you. That's a bad place to be. And what does the Word tell us to do when we see one of our own doing that? What does He say? But exhort, verse 13, but exhort one another daily. As you have the opportunity, when we see our brothers and sisters in Christ drifting away and seeing that hardening of the heart, becoming insensitive to the things of God, beginning to miss church, don't seem to have any spiritual life about themselves, man, we need to exhort them when we have the opportunity because it may come that we don't have the opportunity. They get so far out there, they don't want to hear anything. So we are to exhort them, which means to come along beside them and give them aid, give them comfort, give them encouragement, and get them back. Why? Lest they be hardened through the delusion of sin. You know, when you get out there and you're doing your own thing, calling your own shots, thinking you're in charge, you become so deluded. You are able to justify your sin. You're able to justify not being in church regularly. You're able to justify to yourself you become so deluded that you are okay with who you are and what you've become even when the Word of God says something totally different. Amen. You're okay. My friends, that is a very dangerous place to be at. Very dangerous place to get at. And we are to be looking after each other within the body of Christ that we don't let our brothers and sisters become so deluded. We don't let them become hard-hearted. We don't let them develop that evil heart of unbelief that we're, they're out there and they just don't come around anymore. So we have a responsibility for that. How do we guard against that danger of unbelief and developing that evil heart of unbelief? we got to stay close to the Lord and we've got to stay close to each other. Amen? Amen. Amen. Many of us have quite a few activities that we participate in. Some of us golf, some of us fish, hunt, bowl. Some of you like the knitting club thing. You have other people you exercise with. You've got hunting buddies, walk, people you walk with, book club, all kinds of things that we do that we have participation with other people. Amen? Wait a minute, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's like that. What do we do when somebody don't show up for golf? What do we do when somebody doesn't show up for the breakfast club? What do we do when somebody don't show up for girls not out? Or guys not out? What do we do when somebody don't show up for the fishing trip? Where you at? Where you at? The group that I golf with, we call each other before we golf. <laughs> But you're going to be there, ain't you? When's the last time you called somebody and said, we've got church tomorrow, you're going to be there? We prioritize our pleasure, our entertainment, our exercise, and all these other things, and we want people to participate. My Lord and my God, how much more important is this? All of that stuff that's on that page ain't going to matter in eternity for nothing. We got brothers and sisters in Christ all around us that are developing a hard heart, an evil heart of unbelief. That they're okay doing what they're doing. This brother over here said this morning when he got in this place like that, he said the Lord thumped him. <laughs> if you belong to the Lord, he's going to thump you. He's going to get you back. He's going to discipline you. He's going to chastise you. Right, brother? Amen. Amen. But we need to be looking out after each other. How do we avoid this danger of unbelief? we got to be very careful. we also got to be extremely cautious. Extremely cautious. In verse now, chapter 4, verse 1, here we go again. He says, let us, talking about brethren, therefore, on the basis of the sad history of our forefathers, he says, fear. Fear. <coughs> lest a promise of being left us of entering into rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, and them that heard it, oh my goodness, 
The word fear can be translated, it's defined in the word study as terrify or frighten or reverence. Should we not have a reverential fear that we not miss out on something that God has for us? <laughs> but you know what we're frightened that we might miss out on? The next golf time. <laughs> or the next vacation. The next trip. The next thing of entertainment. Are we concerned that we might miss out on the fullness of Christ? You say, well, I'm saved. Well, honey, that's just the first step. We got to get through the wilderness into the land of promise where we can experience the fullness of Christ in our life. We have been left a promise by God of entering into a spiritual rest in the here and the now so that we can be at peace as we make our way through this life. Do we have a reverential fear? Are we concerned that we're missing out on something that the Lord has for us, spiritually speaking? Wow. Wow. He reminds them that Israel missed out on God's rest by not possessing the land of promise through unbelief and disobedience. He said, listen, they had the truth preached to them just like us in verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them because they failed to mix faith with it and obey it. They failed to believe that God could give them the victory over the giants. They failed to believe that God could get them over that flooded Jordan. They just walked through the Red Sea. It only took them about 11 days to get from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea. 11 days. They saw all kinds of miracles. But for some reason, when they get to the Cadiz Party, it's like, man, we can't do this. You're right, you can't do it, but God can. God promised them a land flow of milk and honey. Promised them spiritual rest. Promised them cities that they would not build. Orchards that they would not plant. Wells that they would not dig. And promised to give them rest from their enemies. They couldn't even open the door. They wouldn't even walk across the threshold. And they resisted God and failed to believe Him, failed to mix faith with what God said, and failed to go into the land of promise. And God judged them, and over the next 40 years, they died in the wilderness one by one. Except for Joshua and Caleb. Who believe God. Amen? Amen? So listen, we got to be extremely cautious that we don't fail to mix faith and obedience with what the Bible says. I can do all things through Jesus Christ which strengthens me. You are more than conquerors through Jesus who loved you, gave yourself for Are you a conqueror? Super conqueror? You got your Achilles heel under your foot? you got victory in your life, victory in Christ. The victory is for all of us to walk in and experience as His children. Are we believing Him? Are we obeying Him? Are we abiding, yielding, and obeying? But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Are we pursuing Him? Are we believing Him? Are we taking that word and believing God for it? You may have heard of this, the bucket list. Been seeing a whole lot about that in the last decade, the bucket list. The list of experiences or achievements that a person hopes to have or accomplish during their lifetime before they kick the bucket or die. The bucket list. I did a little research on the bucket list. There's a lot of them out there. And I didn't see in any of the bucket lists anything spiritual at all. Want more of God in my life. Want to be able to serve God in a more effective way. I want the power of God. It's all about the flesh. All about personal accomplishments. All about personal achievements. About going places. And seeing new places and all like that. I want to go places I've never been before. Well, let me tell you something. The Spirit of God is trying to take you places you've never been before spiritually either. 
He tried to get us out of the church in the wilderness into the church of the fullness of Jesus Christ and walk in his power. He's trying to take us places we've never been before spiritually and empower us to be his people. Hallelujah. Many of the things on the bucket list were good, uh, but I found, I found it humorous. One of the things was I want to spend... Uh, more quality time or want to spend quality time with my family. That's all your bucket list. You're not doing that all the time. <laughs> oh, before I die, I want to spend quality time with my family. <laughs> that just hit me so funny. What do you got a family for? So you can spend quality time with them and fellowship with them and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Shouldn't be on your bucket list and on your everyday list. Amen. 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 The number one thing on the bucket list is want to travel. Want to be somewhere I've never been before. Well, the Lord's trying to take us somewhere we've never been before either. Into the fullness of the land. We need a spiritual bucket list as a believer. And on that bucket list needs to be, I need to enter into the promise that the Lord has made me in Jesus Christ. To experience His fullness and that spiritual rest. Amen not having to fight with myself and struggle with myself about some of the simple disciplines of the faith of spending time with Him on a daily basis in the Word. Personal worship. Being active at church and taking an active part. We should be struggling with ourselves about that. Amen. But now if you belong to the church in the wilderness, you're struggling. <laughs> because that's about your time as you see it. Hmm. One other thing here. Be extremely committed. He says, let us as believers in verse 10, verse 11, let us labor, let us strive, let us be diligent, therefore, to enter into the, that rest, lest any man, any person should fall after the same example of unbelief. Lest any person should fall after the same example of disobedience. The word labor in the King James is interesting. It means to use speed. Whatever you do, do it quickly. To use speed. To make an effort to be prompt or earnest. Diligence. To be diligent. To strive. But I like that nuance of to use speed. And you have to be very committed to use speed. To be prompt. You have to take this very serious. You've got to be extremely committed. Because if you're not extremely committed, this non-commitment, this, you know, whatever attitude will not use speed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you're not committed, you don't use speed. You're not earnest. You're not diligent. It's just whatever. It becomes convenience. If it's convenient, I'll have my quiet time. If it's convenient, I will spend some time praying. I got a lot to do today. I got to get after it. I ain't got time to pray. Honey, when you've got a, a schedule like that, you need to spend more time praying. <clears throat> Not going off without praying. Mm -hmm. Say, but I love the bed too much. Well, that may be a problem there. <laughs> that needs to be dressed. Convenience. I, I, I'll be in church when it's convenient. You're never going to enter into the land and the fullness of Christ's promises with the attitude of, well, I'll enter in when it's convenient. No, you won't because it'll never be convenient. This is about sacrifice. This is about commitment. This is about discipline. And it takes extreme commitment to use speed and to be prompt and to be diligent, very committed. And you get something for that, by the way. You get something for that. What do you get? You get rest. What does he say? He says, let us strive, be diligent, be quick, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of disobedience. That we would enter into that rest. As you read through this text, you'll find this word rest numerous times, ten plus times, rest. Two of the words that's used there, that's used three, three different words. Two of them is listed there to make to cease, to cause to rest. 
Somebody's going to give you some rest in here. Somebody's going to give you some rest in here. Do you ever get so wore out and so spent and so upset and so this or that or the other, you just feel like you're going to collapse and crook? You're a good candidate to experience the rest of God. God can give you some rest. How do you think our missionaries on the foreign field who lose almost everything that they have keep going and keep serving and keep glorifying God and keep ministering because they've got the rest of God in them? They're blessed with His Spirit, blessed with His rest. To give rest, to rest entirely. Now, there's three different rests, three different rests in this passage here that we're studying. There's the Sabbath rest where God worked for six days and then he rested and ceased from all his labor. The seventh day, Sabbath rest. Then there's the promised land rest that he promised Israel. The first generation never received that promise because of unbelief and disobedience. They died in the wilderness one by one. But the second generation, they went into the land and experienced that promised land rest. They experienced victory. God gave them victory over all of their enemies. And then they got to a place that they didn't have to fight anymore. And they rested with God. They didn't do the victory. The, the they fought, but God gave them the victory. It was in His power. Promised land rest. And then future rest is heaven. What does all of that point to? Justification rest. Sabbath rest is justification rest. It's salvation rest. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you rest in the finished work of Calvary. There ain't nothing for you to do on that score. You don't earn it. It is purchased for you through Jesus Christ. And when you receive Him by faith and obedience, you are given justification, rest, salvation, rest. You are declared righteous in the sight of God, not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ has done for you. And you enter into that Peace with God. Peace with God. You're no longer an enemy. You have peace with God. Justification rest. Promised land rest points to submission rest. When we submit before the Lord and we abide in Him and we yield to Him and obey Him and surrender to Him over and over and over until we walk in the Spirit, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh anymore. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ in all of His fullness and we make no provision for our flesh. Romans 13, 14. Why? Because we surrender to Him. He's on the throne of my life and I've entered into submission, rest. I'm not fighting with myself about getting up and going to church. I'm not fighting with myself about spending time with the Lord. I want to. Because that's where his peace and his rest and his power comes from. Proper fellowship with him. Amen. Woo! Oh, this is good. And then future rest is heaven's rest. Hey, man, when we go to heaven, we're going to be delivered from all of this stuff. Justification rest. Salvation rest is peace with God. Submission rest is the peace of God working in us. When we are saved and born again, we have peace with God. We're at rest with God. But when we surrender to Christ and who He is in our life, we have the peace of God and His rest, spiritual rest, is given to us. And it's tangible. We sense it. We realize who we're walking with. His presence, His power. We find ourselves doing stuff we couldn't believe that we could do because we can't do it. He's done it through us. I'm abiding in Him and He's abiding in me and He is producing His life, His fruit in my life and I'm experiencing that. And it's like, man, that's cool. That's awesome. I didn't even get mad about that. Why? Because Jesus is in control. Something comes out of you different than your flesh. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got spiritual rest and spiritual peace and spiritual blessing operate in your life. And then heaven's rest, peace in eternity. But those three things that are justification rest, you are delivered from the penalty of your sins. Submission rest, 
You are delivered from the power, the grip, and the force of sin in your life when He's on the throne of your life. And then heaven's rest, you are delivered from the very presence of sin altogether. Hallelujah. Woo! My goodness. What a day that will be. But until that day comes, I've got the blessing of submission rest. Entering into my inheritance in Christ, His fullness, His presence, His power in my life as I walk with Him. Hallelujah. And He works through my life. In your life. But the sad thing for these believers, they're in danger of unbelief. They had developed an evil heart of unbelief. And they were stuck between Sabbath rest and promised land rest. And died in the wilderness. You say, were they saved? They got out of Egypt, didn't they? They didn't die in Egypt. They died in the wilderness under the judgment of God because they resisted God and refused to believe Him. Take heed. Too many people in the church today are in the wilderness. They are stuck between justification rest and submission rest. They're not pursuing a fuller life with Christ. They're not pursuing the deeper life. They're not pursuing that spiritual rest that only Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit gives us when we surrender to Him. Amen? Amen. they still too much in control. They're struggling in the flesh. Not surrender. Do yourself a favor and your family a favor and surrender. Get into the fullness of the Lamb. Get to walk in the Spirit and experience peace and blessing like you've never experienced in your life. You got God in you. Let Him manifest Himself in you. Now I got these little old pieces of candy, individually wrapped, three musketeer bars, not any bigger than a quarter. Little old tiny things. And I said, "What did you get those for?" She said, "Well, I heard if you get those and put them in the freezer and freeze them, they're really good." And she said, "They've been in there for a while. I think they're frozen. You want to have one before lunch?" And I said, okay. And then I said, no, 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 I don't. Let's just split it. You just cut it right down the middle. You can have half and half. She said, I don't want half of it. I want the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I look to God. That every believer in here would want the whole thing in Christ. Amen. Would not be satisfied with wondering with just their sins forgiven. But they want the fullness of Christ in their life. And that they would strive, they would be diligent to pursue that spiritual rest in Jesus Christ until they possessed it and began to experience it. Amen? Amen. You say, how are we going to do that? Well, folks, let us be extremely careful, cautious, and very committed, extremely committed to pursuing Him. And as he ends up the chapter, he gives us two things that's going to help us on our way into that spiritual rest. The Word of God, listen to what he says. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions and motivations of the heart. You get in this word and you stay in this word. If you've got an evil heart of unbelief developing in you, and this living word will cut right to the quick. All your self justifications, all your manipulations, all your delusions that you have, the word of God will cut right to the quick and divide that and show you yourself and what you need to do before it. The great high priest Jesus, the Son of God, come to his throne where we might find grace and help in our time of need. Right there it is, the Word of God in Jesus. Jesus. That's it. But the issue is for us, do we want half or do we want the whole thing? Let us be like Donna and want the whole thing. All that Christ has for us. Amen? It's your blessing. 
It's your spiritual life. It's your blessing. Your spiritual life. I want the whole thing. I want the whole thing. Let's bow before the Lord.